Um, first session is going to be the, uh, the um, rebirth of sport, followed by Nielsen, who are going to show some pretty interesting numbers around the sports industry today. So again, all setting the scene for the rest of, rest of the day. So without further ado, I've already thanked him twice, but please welcome uh, the CEO of Sports Singapore, Mr. Tech Yin Lim. I think we've just broken one of the rules by shaking hands. But that was a fist pump. <laughs> um, Tech Yin, thank you so much for, for joining us. Welcome to, welcome to, um, to Sports Matters uh, again. Um, we haven't seen you for a, a couple of years. Um, just want to give a quick overview into what's going on in the world, what's going on, not just Singapore, but really the region um, as, as a whole. Um, what successes have you seen coming through since, since we last saw you in 2019 on stage? What's, what, what, what have been the successes? Well, first I want to say thank you for having me back. And I also want to say that it just seems like yesterday when I was here on stage and you were not wearing a tie, <laughs> and I was. Yeah. So I think we've, we've gotten on in age. But, time, um, time has moved quick. <laughs> I, I think the big thing that's happened in the, the world of sport, as in many other areas, has been that digital matters. Um, it is fair to say that everyone has been trying to continue to reach out to their clients, their fans, their base of support uh, through digital platforms. And this is something that we've been speaking about probably at least for a decade uh, in the past, where people saw the value and the potential of the internet, but were thinking about very hard about how to monetize this. And I think in the last two years, the push uh, to go digital um, has, I think, brought about new ideas on how to monetize. Uh, it has certainly given an opportunity to reach a whole lot more people than we used to be able to reach, and even for, for a platform like this, um, it shows that uh, the world is now one marketplace. Um, in the region, I think it's been, it's been a little bit difficult. Different countries have been managing the pandemic uh, according to their own national priorities. And sport has taken a bit of a hit, a sort of a back seat, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. But thankfully, I think for Singapore, uh, we've been fortunate to be able to stay connected, expand our base of reach across all age groups, from youth to seniors. Um, we were putting in a lot of effort to get our seniors to be digitally literate and to begin to participate at home in health and fitness exercise and, and programs. And I think they do represent a new market for us uh, for sport as well. Um, I think the government has invested a considerable amount of money to keep businesses alive, whether it's through the resilience package budgets, the job support schemes, rental rebates, and for Sports Singapore, we were happy to present a digital innovation grant uh, of about $10 million uh, to businesses that we've, we've sort of awarded in the last one and a half years. Uh, 85 businesses benefited from that innovation grant. And I think we will see the fruits of that investment in the next few years. Um, we, you know, we tried to keep our event partners close uh, we continue to support the ASEAN Basketball League and the local Singapore Slingers. Uh, we've been working closely with uh, event promoters to talk about the potential uh, to host events here. And, I, and I'm very happy to see that from next month, uh, events will start to roll out. And this is only possible because the capability continues to, to be there. Uh, the, the appetite continues to be there. And... Um, I'm optimistic for the next few months. Fantastic. Well, again, I mean, thank you for sticking with the, in, I mean, really continuing on. I mean, so, so challenging for, for you and, and your team. Um, I mean, what have been the main challenges and, and how, 
have your team been getting over them? Well, I think for everybody, the challenge is uncertainty. Not being able to plan ahead with confidence has meant that uh, sometimes you just have to react. Um, I remember the ATP 250 event that took place in Singapore was something that was offered to us and from offer to working to implementation was just one month. And I was deeply impressed by the local industry capability to be able to put that together uh, in such a short time. So this uncertainty is not the way we want to, to move going forward. It will be with us at least for a few more months, I believe. Uh, I think next month's Suzuki Cup uh, is a major event that we've got to plan for. Um, you know, the, the promoters and the football association are still waiting for the green light to sell tickets. And it's happening within weeks. Yep. So this sort of uncertainty remains, but as long as we are determined, uh, we will be able to see sport return. We've started a pilot on getting team sport back, uh, trying to see how prepared um, the different venues, the different academies and clubs are in being able to implement measures. And to date, we've got about 60 applications for that pilot. So I think it's a, it's a healthy sign of pent-up demand that we should all be latching on to in 2022. Next month, two big events, so Suzuki Cup and the World Table Tennis Finals will be in Singapore. So we're going to be talking to Malcolm about, about the Suzuki Cup, but, but look, it sounds like sports still matters. It certainly does. You know, the, the awareness, the, the sensibility that sport and physical activity is really important uh, to stay healthy and stay fit. Um, it's, it's out there. And we've seen participation rates grow. And the big challenge for us, obviously, for everyone involved in sport and physical activity and the industry is to see how to enhance the quality of that investment in time and energy. And in that regard, I think going digital has enabled us, as I said, for reach, but it's also giving us a lot of data. And I think that data that we, we now have access to is something that we want to share quite extensively. So pre-pandemic, pandemic, I know I used to, we used to talk about this a lot, um, you, 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 were always promote, you, you weren't just promoting Singapore as, as, a, as a hub, you were promoting ASEAN as a, as a sporting region. Um, do you think that ASEAN is going to be able to compete with the rest of Asia as a global sporting power? I think we've seen the growth of demand for sport in Asia um, being quite exponential. And I think the people in ASEAN are no different. They are hungry, they want to be able to consume sport, they want to be able to play sport. Uh, the question is how we connect our marketplaces so that businesses can benefit from this demand growth. I think there are a few interesting platforms that are emerging within the next couple of years. Uh, the FIBA World Basketball Championships that will be co-hosted by two ASEAN countries, the Philippines and Indonesia, uh, together with uh, Japan. Uh, will provide opportunity for spin-off fringe events to take place in other ASEAN countries. And generally, we are in discussion now with FIBA, with hoping to bring a fringe event to Singapore in conjunction with that, but also more deliberately growing the three-on-three -three game, the 3v3 game, and what it means to be able to create a very exciting 3v3 calendar in ASEAN. Um, we've got the Women's World Cup football happening in Australia and New Zealand in 2023. And again, we've been in touch previously with the organizers in Australia to say, can we in Singapore do something on the fringe of that? Uh, Singapore is, uh, has put in a bid to host a major global event, uh, and uh, we'll be ready to announce uh, in the next two months. Uh, I thought about announcing today, but I realized that I didn't get my clearance. But we want, uh, do we want to it's a big event. Uh, <laughs> We're up against some pretty stiff competition, but if we have that, part of our bid has also been to pledge an ASEAN legacy. And so I think that's another piece. So we, we need platforms 
like this. Technology and digital is another platform uh, we have invited and happily the Global Sport Innovation Center powered by Microsoft has agreed to set up its APAC uh, office here in Singapore and they open on December the 7th at the Singapore Sports Hub. Uh, they have some interesting partners uh, as part of their portfolio and network and I think that August will unleash the raw of the football project. We've announced our partnership with La Liga. Ivan is here. Um, while that is meant to help us develop local football, I think there is a lot of value there in extending that reach uh, of football development plans to the rest of Southeast Asia. And this is something that we would want to work with La Liga very closely, uh, particularly with respect to children and youth. The ASEAN Sports Ministers meeting that just happened um, last month uh, received an ASEAN Sport Participation Benchmark Report across ASEAN cities. And I think there were some interesting insights there that allow us to follow up on how else we could work together as ASEAN cities in being able to promote sport and physical activity. So the platforms are available. Uh, the technology, collaboration, and the opportunity for digital businesses to reach out to Southeast Asia are there. Uh, we've got the innovation engines, we've got the innovation grants. Uh, so I think it's looking up. And, and I mean, we had a whole two days on gaming matters three weeks ago, but you've, 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 you're supporting the global esports games as well. So you, you have, as Sports Singapore, acknowledged esports as sport. Well, we acknowledge that all our youth are interested in gaming. The, the gaming participation numbers go through the roof. And I think gamers are potential athletes, athletes are potential gamers. Uh, so it's an engagement platform that we cannot ignore. Uh, but we continue to work with the Global Esports uh, Federation on this idea of the blend between physical activity and sporting activity with the virtual world. And I think that represents an interesting uh, development for us. Well, good, good luck with the, the Global Esports Games in, Thank you. in December. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to um, bring three more speakers on stage. We're still talking about the rebirth of sport and really setting up the rest of today. So we're going to hopefully get them to sit in the right order of the, of the screen. So we've got Lionel Yeo, who's the CEO of Sports Hub. We have Malcolm Thorpe, who's the Managing Director of Sports 5. And Crystal Quek, who's the COO of Bolt Global. Yes, they did it, they did it, that's good. See, now the safety management officers won't have a go at me for it. Lionel, th thank you for, for joining. Wel welcome ba back to Sports Matters. Pleasure. Um, uh, we're talking about the rebirth of sport. Um, just, just to set the scene, what can we do at the moment with Sports Hub and what are we hoping to be able to do in the future? Well, the government has just announced uh, a further sort of uh, liberalization coming out of the stabilization phase. It will allow us to have um, sports and fitness related activities at slightly larger numbers, right? So more people per lane in a swimming pool, for example, more people per badminton court, those sort of things. Um, but I think the most significant thing is that, as Tech In mentioned in his remarks, next weekend, we're looking at a really busy weekend of sporting events. Um, I counted at least four. You know, on the, on the 3rd of December, um, one championship is holding an event at Singapore Indoor Stadium. Chachi is going to be here later today. On the 4th of December, it's a Saturday, um, the World Table Tennis Cup Finals kick off at the OCBC Arena. On the 5th of December, of course, the Suzuki Cup kicks off at the National Stadium. And that 4th, 5th weekend, we have 4,000 people running through the Sports Hub as part of the Stan Chart Marathon. So it's a super busy weekend for us. And, you know, it's, it's still early days yet, I have to say, because you know, we're not at full capacity at these venues, but it's a very encouraging start. So all, all the buses are, are coming at once. Um, we're going to be talking about sports tech through the day. I mean, there's, so there's, two, there's two sessions. Have you seen, I mean, without giving anything away, but have you seen any, any exciting tech coming out that, that for, for stadiums? Oh, there are all kinds, Jasper. Um, I mean, there's, there's digitalization is something which is sweeping across the entire economy. So the sports industry is definitely not uh, uh, sort of left behind. And there are all kinds of solutions that are helping us back-end B2B. There are all kinds of solutions that are also helping us with the B2C engagement. 
Um, and I think these are the kind of things that we are looking at in a, in a, in a very serious way at the, at the Sports Hub. And that's why you know, my colleague, uh, Chief Technology Officer, is also you know, a, a panel at one of your later uh, sessions talking about sports technology. Fantastic. So, Malcolm, um, you're, as the Managing Director of Sport 5, you're, you're, you're doing the next event, right? Pretty much. You're doing Suzuki Cup. We're doing Suzuki Cup. So, so Suzuki. Tell, tell everyone here what, 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 what to expect at Suzuki Cup. What is the Suzuki Cup and what, what's going to happen? Well, Suzuki Cup is simply the biggest football event and therefore actually the biggest event in the ASEAN region. Um, to put it in context, it outperforms the FIFA World Cup, the Euros, um, and, and any other uh, football property throughout the region. Um, so it's, it's going to be, it's going to have the same fantastic attention across the region. Uh, it's delayed for a year. We were supposed to be doing this a year ago. We were supposed to be doing it across 10 different markets. Um, in, um, and it's been quite a process to get it to where it is today, which is going to be the whole thing taking place on exactly the same playing schedule as before, but just all in one country. And we're lucky enough here in Singapore that this is where it's going to be. And it's going to be a fantastic celebration of the return of major football to this region. It's going to be great. Is, is Singapore a hub? I mean, I, I don't want to say is Singapore a sports hub, because, but is, is Singapore a, a sport? Is it a hub? Singapore is an important place, particularly this year, because um, because of the way Singapore has been able to manage uh, the situation over the last few years, Singapore was, to a large extent, the obvious choice for, the, for, for Suzuki Cup for this year, because we could have certainty around the, the staging criteria, um, have certainty in the, the, in the facilities that are here, uh, and uh, have, have as, as Tekin was talking about before, the base of capability that there is in this market uh, means that it's a great place for hosting major events like this. Fantastic. Well, good, good luck for the, for the Suzuki Cup. It's great that it's, it's, it's happening. Um, Crystal, um, please, uh, now you're at a sports event. We, we, we met you at Gaming Matters a few weeks ago, and I thought you have to be at Sports Matters to talk about the stuff that you're doing. Maybe introduce yourself and a little bit about Bolt Global, and then NFTs, WTF. <laughs> yeah, that's the hot topic of the moment, right? What NFTs are. But thank you so much, Jasper, and thank you everyone for having me here today. I recognize I'm not a sports veteran, but you know, we're trying to do what we can to make the world of sport a bit more interesting in our own little ways and more immersive as well. So, Board Global is a uh, decentralized finance and media ecosystem. We're powered by the blockchain. And we have three main products, Boat Plus, which is our live streaming service, available iOS, Android, and on Hisense uh, smart TVs. Boat X, which is our crypto wallet. And Exchange, which is our decentralized finance-based marketplace where you can also trade NFTs. So WTF is an NFT, right? I'm not going to swear because the safety officers might haul me off as well. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of people ask me that question, what really is an NFT? Is it just a JPEG? you know, on the internet where I can just copy and paste it and maybe I can sell it for another six-figure sum. No, that is not that. An NFT is just simply a representation of a unique token that is verified by the blockchain. It's stored on the blockchain. And when you have that NFT or that representation, that record in your wallet, you can trade it on open marketplaces like you may have heard of OpenSea, which is a really popular NFT marketplace where the draw-dropping records of NFT sales have occurred. Incredible uh, amounts of money have been traded there. So NFTs basically allow for you to prove you own this particular unique IP by yourself and you can trade it without an intermediary. That really is what it is. And I think it has given rise to a lot of different types of really unique fan engagements, uh, unique communities that are being built. You know, the most famous one has been Bought Ape uh, Yacht Club, for example. Once you have a unique picture of this ape, it's sort of like your avatar and you get access to this really closed community of people that love rock, that love, you know, different types of music. And I think a lot of this can be applied to sports. We see this a lot happening already for esports, for example, what, you know, you and Tik Yin were talking about just now. Um, and, and so, for, for people in the room today, well, I mean, we, we, there is a, there's a, there's a, 
a, full, a whole panel on, on NFTs and, uh, late, later on this morning, but, but how is it really going to adapt into our day-to-day -day lives? I think whatever we're seeing today with NFTs is really the first step. Right now, it's just, it, is, it is represented by a 2D picture. It could be your meta avatar that you, you did during the virtual event. It could be a lot of things, but I think as long as you have an object and you want to prove ownership of it, that can exist in the virtual world on the blockchain that is verifiable. But it could be anything else. It could be a song. It could be an experience. It could be, it literally is, I would say, a ticket to a new experience. That is maybe a new way of thinking about it. Yeah. Lionel. You know, at a very basic level, I think for event organizers, they have to think about NFTs as broadening the universe of merch. Right? We're used to the traditional idea of merchandise. You go to the concert, you buy the T-shirt. Right? Now, in future, when people attend their BTS concerts or their Coldplay concerts, they may want to have an NFT to, to prove that they were there at a national stadium. Right? If they attend a National Day Parade, I mean, they should be thinking about NFTs for, for future. Uh, National Day Parade. So that's, it's, it, at a very basic level, it expands the universe of merchandise that people want to own and say that they were there. Yeah, it's, 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 it's so exciting. I mean, again, gaming matters was all about NFTs. Music matters tomorrow. We've got a lot on NFTs. Marketing matters a lot about, more about the metaverse and stuff. Um, Malcolm, is Sport5 getting into NFTs yet? Have you, have you explored it? Yeah, we've got uh, a lot of clients um, who are rights holders. And they are a, a very interesting um, uh, platform for uh, NFT-focused uh, uh, exchanges. There's a lot of money being spent at the moment on people in the NFT, NFT universe who want to get themselves out there, have products that they can utilize uh, their technology around. And so we're actually doing more and more in that field, um, looking to support the rights holders that we have so that they can figure out for their particular space, where it is that they can use this for fan engagement particularly, um, but also for, for monetization for themselves. Really interesting. Cool. Um, so to all of you now, I, I think, again, in this, this whole concept of setting up the rest of the day, um, what matters today, but what's really exciting for the future tech in? Well, what matters today is for us to bring participation back. I think the pandemic has obviously had an impact on our children and our youth. Two, two years worth of uh, just physical exercise without sport doesn't help uh, future participation and interest. And so we have to bring that back in a big way. The government in Singapore continues to be fully invested in sport. We are on a massive building program for infrastructure. Uh, so in the next three, five to ten years, there'll be some new and very attractive sport complexes that are being built uh, in Pongol, in Sabawang, in Topayo, which will be rebuilt. And down in Kalang, we will have a new Singapore Tennis Centre, uh, our football hub, a velodrome, and a urban youth sport hub. So I think um, this idea that we can work together with industry to bring the type of innovation uh, that will attract participation on a broad scale, as well as drive an interest to spectate and become sport fans is something that we will work towards. Fantastic. Same question, Lionel, what, what's, what does the future hold? What's exciting? I think for the sports industry, you know, uh, there are two things that come to my mind. Um, I wouldn't talk about tech because you have two entire sessions on that, so that's the third thing. But the other two things are really, you know, thinking about fan engagement for the future, and then thinking about navigating social political trends. In terms of fan engagement, I think we're all very aware that you know, there's a challenge to get the attention of the youth, to engage the youth. Uh, everybody's interested in gaming. But I think we all have to think a little bit more creatively into what are the hybrid types of events and festivals that brings together more traditional sports with gaming, with other lifestyle elements, and, and, and then package holistically, we engage the youth that way. Because I think otherwise we are at real danger of having that uh, disengagement. Um, in terms of what, met, what else matters to the sports industry, social political trends, I say that because I think it's something that we all have to learn how to navigate. 
you know, whether it's women's issues, uh, gender issues, or whether it's just thinking about how are we going to deal with the Chinese market. You know, there's a real risk that there could be a bifurcation. Nobody wants to see that. Um, and we want to figure out how we can continue to sort of engage, at least as one region, Asia-Pacific region. Um, and I think that's something which we have to, you know, tread delicately um, and, 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 and coolly about it. But we will be back in the Sports Hub watching you two again one day. That is my hope. Well, maybe not you two. That wasn't an <laughs> announcement. <laughs> <laughs> um, Malcolm, before I ask you the same question, um, I did mean to ask, we were talking about Suzuki Cup, and, and it's fantastic you're doing it. What are the challenges? Of, uh, what, what, what are the, you know, in a nutshell, is, is, is Singapore a bubble? Are you flying all the teams in? What, what are the challenges you faced in putting together such a massive tournament? I'd go even further back than that. When it became apparent, you know, more than a year ago that we couldn't do it in the normal way, the process that we've been through to get to where we are today, even before the event starts, has all been about managing the stakeholders. Um, AFF as the event owner, um, the sponsors, Suzuki and all the others, all of our broadcast partners, and it's all been about keeping people informed, letting them know what the planning process is, giving them confidence that the, the plans and processes that we're putting in place are going to be good for them, uh, for the teams and for the fans. Um, so it's been a long process as we've built up over, over the last few months to get to where we are now. Where we are now is we're going to have, as I said, all, the full schedule of the tournament taking place. Uh, we've got two venues set up in Singapore. We're going to have um, the full broadcast across the region. We would normally have, um, last time the event took place, we had 750,000 people in the stadiums. We're not going to get that this year, unfortunately. But I think the broadcast platform across the region and beyond is going to be even bigger than it was before. The pent-up uh, excitement about the event that we, we can see, the new platforms that have come into place over the last few uh, couple of years that we now know how to use. So yes, we'll have you know, live terrestrial broadcast across the whole region, but we're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, we're on Insta, um, we're on Goal.com, we're on TikTok, we're across all of the platforms. We're going to have a conversation about bulk. Um, so it, it's all ready to go, and um, but so the teams will come in. The teams will be in bubbles. Um, we've got the, there's a, a crazy amount of detail around what is allowed and what is not allowed. And with all due respect, Jasper, yes, this is great. This is quite simple <laughs> when we're no, talking I, about I, 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 putting on the, the the thing. But it's you know it, you know what it's like is really what I mean. It's complicated, um, and there are a lot of people who are going to work really hard. Have been working really hard. And it's going to be all the way through to New Year's Day. Hopefully, we'll, you know, everything will run smoothly. It probably won't all run smoothly. We'll have to manage that. It'll be complicated. But the main thing is, it's back. People coming into stadiums to enjoy the sports experience in the way that it's supposed to be enjoyed. Uh, and that then is the platform for the sponsors, for the broadcasters, and, and for, the, the, for, the, for the ecosystem around sport to work. And that, so it all comes back to having it having people kick a ball around on, on a football field. It's going to be great. How many people are flying in? Uh, all the teams together is about 500 people. Um, we've got teams in, in a whole range of different hotels. We've, got, um, we've obviously got all the officials as well coming in. So, yeah, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. Okay. Luckily, we're not responsible for all of it. <laughs> just, just anyone who's flying in, send them a message saying, read everything, because people don't. That's, another, that's for another, another conversation. Crystal, fin finally with you, the f you, are, you are the future of, uh, but, well, the future of, of part of the sports industry, but what's exciting for, for Bolt, what's exciting for you, what's exciting for sport? No, thank you. I mean, it's really inspiring to hear the different conversations from people who are actually practitioners in the field and passionate about sport. And I do believe that sport is all about the everyday life and not just tempo moments. Actually, I'd like to share a story that a lot of people don't even know on what inspired us to build what it is today. So we actually got the rights to broadcast the ICC Cricket World Cup in 2019 and parts of the World uh, Rugby World Cup as well in 2019, the mobile rights. And what we have realized during that point in time, I think there are three major observations, I would say. The first part is that a lot of people focus on the actual live event, but sometimes they forget about the pre-game anticipation and sort of the post-match you know, commiserations, right? So 
For us, we were just sort of doing a broadcast. We have not really included a lot of interactive features then. You know. So we did a lot of the sort of uh, pre-game anticipation chatter on Facebook, on our own Twitter channels. And then we realized it was really inefficient. I didn't want to have to post and pray that you know, our posts will go viral for the International you know, Cricket World Cup, right? So we started building in live chat functionality uh, into our platform. When the World Rugby Cup happened, we were actually really astounded by the amount of chatter going on also on Twitter. I used to work at Twitter. So, I mean, it was a natural place for sports and for conversations to happen. Then I realized, hey, there isn't really a proper platform out there which allows me to watch the uh, live action and for me to read what's happening in real time, the tweets that are happening. So we built that feature as well in Boat Plus. And then after that, we started getting eSports streamers coming into the platform. And that's how we sort of built the sporting and you know, digital content experience. We built it around our users. We built it around the fans. So eSports streamers started coming on board. We signed a deal with a really large um, Indian eSports league, uh, Residence eSports. They have about 500, no, 600 now uh, eSports streamers and you know, massive, massive reach, right? 200 million uh, reach, I would say, around the world. And they came to us and they're like, could we work on NFTs together? Could we work on different ways for us to realize new revenue streams without you know, different partners taking 40 or 50% of our revenue share? And that's when we started building out the wallet properly, the exchange, live tipping using crypto. So I would say the future of sport really would lie in the hands of the fans. It is also about being able to not just focus on the tempo, but the everyday always on conversations. I mean, Jasper, you're an avid cyclist. I love cycling too, right? I actually can't believe why there isn't a proper esports cycling competition where we get to see Jasper doing his thing on Zwift. I mean, that would be an incredible... I would, I would pay to watch that, you know, <laughs> to be honest. You're saying you want to see me in Lycra, that's what you're trying... Actually, you should get Hugo Boss to get a proper cycling outfit for you. That would be incredible. Think, and then we can Hugo do... I well. people are here today, but... Crystal, thank, thank you so much. We're, we're, we're pretty much out of time. Um, but, I mean, thinking about the last two years and hearing the messaging that's coming out today, and I hope we're not tempting fate, um, but digital matters, data matters, and we're going to be hearing from Nielsen in a second. Um, there is still a lot of uncertainty out there, clearly. Um, but we're really talking about the return of sport, and that is so positive. Um, we talked about crypto and how NFTs matter, um, bringing sports back. How about bringing sports participation back as well? Not just getting kids out back playing, playing football or netball and basketball again. Talking about collaboration, so sports coming together with other industries as well. Um, the future's bright, but it's back. And so with that, what a great way to start Sports Matters. Tech Yin, Lionel, Malcolm and Crystal, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, please enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh.